I'm going to show you how you can automate an entire AI vector business. We'll run through creating AI vectors like these and how you can market and deploy them in original and effective ways to maximize your potential revenue. How to find product niches that work well. Well, a great place to start your research is on Etsy. And I can tell you why. It's because you get a lot of interesting data shown up straight away. So if you just type in vector, you can have a look at what comes up at the top. Now, ignore these, the ads. There are Etsy ads. So you can see this is an ad by Etsy seller. But you do, do want to come down and see which ones are organically near the top of the search listings. So look at these botanical designs here. This person has got 9.2K reviews. So this is Emily Esther. We can take a little look at her shop. You can see she's making SVGs. She's made more than 80,000 sales. And at around $5 per sale, she's easily hitting 400,000K in revenue. But if we're looking actually a little bit deeper at what is doing well, you can see that these cute little icons, I would say there's almost a little bit of a Japanese theme going on, a kawaii theme. And I definitely like the look of these. And you can see it's in 20 plus carts, which means there's 20 people who have put it in their basket and are waiting for it to be bought. So that's something we can bear in mind, and it's a useful place. Another tool I suggest you have a look at is Allura, which allows you to do a little bit more research on Etsy shops. It's basically a, an, an analytics tool for looking at Etsy shops. So you can come to the shop analyzer and you can put in Emily Esther Designs, for example. Have a little search. A searchy search, nothing like a little bit of searching. And we can see what they get. You can see that for some reason it didn't come up with the exact revenue stats. So we press on refresh and see what we get. What have you got for us, my dear friend? So you can see here that she does have an estimated revenue of 140,000 pounds. I think my calculation was slightly off due to the different pricing of items. But again, it's validated that we can see that there is a lot of opportunity. You see there's one product, these 200 doodle animals is making 250 pounds per month. And it's only uh, one year old and it's already made 3,300 pounds. So that looks like a interesting product to keep in mind for our research. Our research. And a, another good marketplace to take a look at is Creative Market. This is because you can go to, for example, illustrations and filter by vector. And then you can make sure that the drop down is set to popular. And you can see which ones are rising to the top here. And you can see there are things to do with business. Tulips. Tulips are hot this year. Everyone likes a good tulip. Maybe it's that time of year for tulipers. So you might have a look at these for some ideas about different concepts. See what's trending well, what's selling well. But you also want to take a look at what's visually appealing in the cultural zeitgeist. And for that, you will use slightly different tools. So I recommend using social media platforms for designers where they share their work. And you can see what is naturally rising to the top. And I like Dribble a lot. And you can filter by popular and also change the time frame. So I like to go to this past month. And this gives you basically all of the most popular works that have been shared in the last month. And these are the most popular as decided essentially by designers. So it gives you a slightly different impression of what designers think is at the top of the cultural identity right now. And I really like to use this because uh, I like to take the influence from that and apply it to some of the products that are selling well on other marketplaces. So you can see that a product type is selling well, then it's really great to take uh, what's visually trending well, which is usually a little bit ahead of the curve. And it will take a little while to filter down to actually what customers are selecting, but eventually they tag on to the trends. So you take the fact that designers uh, live their lives by being slightly ahead of trends, by creating trends and following trends more early than consumers. And you can see that these there's certainly definitely a color theme that's coming through to me that's feeling very evident here that is uh, certainly feeling on on trend. There's this quite, uh, I would say it's almost a triadic colors where there are three strong co colors from different areas of the color wheel. And this is really standing out to me a lot. You can see that there is the, the blue, yellow and green 
yeah, you can see that there is the blue, purple, and yellow here. On this one, we have the orange, blue, and green. Here again, we have the yellow, mauve, and blue. Now, I also recognize, for me, there is the, this sense of, of quite flat style is pervading across. It seems like the, there's a lot of, almost a feeling of vector 2D nature. And the other thing that I can see is there are these uh, almost fake, realistic, textured effects. So they're trying to imitate real life effects, but in a digital way. So we can see this two-tone half print effect, which makes it feel like it's uh, from a traditional printing method, but actually it's just a digital recreation. Uh, and these are really beautiful. I adore this work from Loli Gaz. Thank you, Loli Gaz. So you can take some of these things, you can copy them, and you can put them in an inspiration document. I'm going to put it here in Figma, which is where I will keep my inspiration together. It's always good to have a collection of inspiration. So I'm going to start to put my inspiration together. We're also going to take a look at Wirestock, which is a perfect tool for speeding up the process of submitting your digital goods to multiple marketplaces in one go. It's an invaluable service at automating and speeding up your process. So now we've taken a little visual probe and we've taken a market probe where we've taken a little taster of what the visual trends are in the market at the moment and also what is selling well globally. And what we're going to do now is a very important step and this is one that I think people jump over a lot is that we're going to invent a bit. We're actually going to be creative. So we're not just going to copy other people. We're going to use our own brain boxes and we're going to apply our own creativity to a certain product. And this is really important because you need your product to stand out amongst the competitive market that is out there of digital products. It is a growing market, but it's also a market that is highly competitive, as all lucrative markets are. And for that, you have to actually use a little bit of strategy. So it doesn't matter if you work very hard or even if you create an excellent product, you need an effective strategy. And beyond that, you always need, I would say, a little bit of luck. And it's very important to recognize when you have been lucky uh, and uh, actually note out like, oh, well, I made that decision, which I didn't think of, but actually that was a really important decision as to why this has been successful. So always keep thinking about what is the reason why something has happened and how you can use that in future. So I like to use three different ways to try to be more original. The first is to combine other people's ideas. So take two different types of products that are working really well and see if there's a unique way that you can put them together. So you might take, for example, the idea of using doodle animals and do it in a completely different style. For example, you might do it entirely in, in 3D. For example, you could do it in 3D, you could do it in color, you could do it with textures, you could do it in watercolor, you can use different mediums, you can use different styles, perhaps they're more realistic, perhaps they're more abstract. Perhaps they're using just geometric stripes. These are a couple of options you can think of using. So we could also just go back into Etsy and I'll give you a couple of other options about how you can combine things inventively. So here you can see that they have silhouettes. So this is another interesting way to differentiate your work. So if we have a look at Creative Market, you can see that some popular ways to sell these are as collections. So you might want to take, yeah, you can combine anything really in different ways. Geometric gradient fruits for example, or you could have abstract girl boss. You could have whimsical cartoon girl boss. This is a great way just to give you some ideas about a potential product that is using successful products already. And on that premise, you can imagine that it's likely that your product will also be successful if you are picking things that have a developed demand. But you want to make sure that you're being original. So keep that in mind. Ah, the next thing to do is to jump on a trend. So you have to look at what is trending, what is coming out, and you can see that there is a demand for something that is new, you can start to focus on that. For example, you might look at a trend of using printed effects, like how can you recreate traditional printmaking effects in a digital way? So you can create a set of vectors that allow you to apply print effects to your work. That would be a really good product idea. You might even look just uh, at the news and see if there's something that you can take influence from, like AI. Obviously, everyone's talking about AI, but you could create vectors around AI. You can see here that they're using a stock image, which is absolutely horrendously cliche. So there's an opportunity to use that as a topic to inform your work that's going to rise on what people are already interested in. And to give you another example, let's have a look at some other news that's going on right now. Come into the news. 
we'll put it locally, the UK. Yeah, so it's the coronation this weekend for King Charles. So that's a, a topic that you could really create content for. I mean, it's a little bit late now for, for doing that, but what you want to do is be planning ahead because there's going to be a lot of people, news outlets, media companies looking for content vectors, images based around this certain theme. And this is a, a perfect example of something that you could create a set of work for. So that's another thing you can do is look at trends emerging as well as uh, contemporary news. And the third option is to niche or niche down depending on how you like to say the word. And what we do with a niche is we look at a really specific use case. So we might target, for example, uh, garden centers and just create beautiful illustrations that they can use on their gardening signs. Or you might target vegan bakers. But the idea is to really narrow down your market and create something that's perfect for a select audience. And by doing this, you're setting yourself apart from the competition and also making sure that you have a product that people will want. I certainly recommend when you first start out making digital products is going as narrow as possible with a defined use case that is validated. And then as you get more experience, you can start to target more competitive areas. So now it's time to jump into mid journey and we're going to create some vector artwork. This is one of my favorite parts of the process because we're going to be a little bit creative. And I've been playing around with creating some vectors. And there are a couple of tips I'm going to share with you about getting images that are going to work really well for vectors inside of a journey. And what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to type in forward slash prefer, and we're going to click on the first option, which is prefer suffix. This will allow us to set a specific suffix, a specific ending to all of our prompts without having to type it out each time. And I found that AR one by one, which means we're creating square images and with an aspect ratio of one by one, work best for vectors. It's really interesting to see how mid-journey reinterprets different prompts based on different aspect ratios. I think there's something inherently devised about Midjourney that when it has a landscape aspect ratio, it makes better landscapes. And when it has a portrait aspect ratio, it makes better full body and portrait style images. But with something like a sticker, like it's really very, it is kind of square. The idea is that we want something quite, uh, mm, quite rounded, and quite centralized. So I've really found the aspect ratio of one to one work best for all of my stickers and vectors. And the next one up is we're going to add in dash dash no gradient and text. This means that Midjourney will avoid putting in gradients and text. And this helps us a lot down the road when we're taking our images and converting them into vectors. So that's it. Now you can press enter. And it means now every time we type in a prompt, we're going to get those at the end, which will help us a hell of a lot. But we still need a prompt. So therefore, we're going to put in our a prompt. I'm going to be using a single kawaii sticker. White background, minimal, cyborg, cute, tiny, Japanese, lovable, pastel colors, vector style, simple. So I've put in a few prompt words, which will help us get a vector style to make sure that the output is very simple without too much detail, which will help us turn it into a vector. And for my product approach, I've decided to go with something influenced a little bit by creating cute doodles in a Japanese style. So I definitely think there is a Western obsession at the moment with <laughs> Eastern culture, especially Japanese and Korean culture, and uh, creating works inspired by this is a really good approach. You can see that these are very subtly inspired by Japanese works, but I'm going full on Japanese style. And kawaii actually refers to a type of Japanese style. It's cute, it's lovable, it's mm, delicious, it's endearing and cute. And for my theme, I'm actually going to create some AI related cute stickers. <laughs> so some cute vector vectors related to AI. I think this is a really interesting opportunity because we're taking the theme of AI and technology, which is exploding right now and creating some cute objects related to that. So I mean, it gives people like an option to use something a little bit different than this very what I would call extremely uh, sterile, cold, dark and meaningless image. Uh, because the actual what is the actual meaning of this? All we can see is some um, random code going into a face made of a network. I mean, it's it's too abstract and it's not related or stuck in humanity. For me, like the emotion I feel seeing this is, is like I'm in a hospital and I'm about to be operated on, I suppose. Is, that is a little bit like how the title wants us to feel, but it doesn't make me want to click on it. 
So I'm going to go ahead and press enter and wait to see what we get out. Yes, while that's working away, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a separate product niche that I'm interested in exploring. If we go into Adobe Stock, which is a stock image website, and I'm going to show you a type of image that I was looking at earlier. There are these brush shapes. These are really simple vectors of different brush shapes. And I was looking at these and I was thinking that there is some wonderful ways to repurpose this type of product. So I'm also going to have a little go at creating some vectors on this. And the prompt that I'm using for that is black paint stroke shapes and ink stroke shapes, variety oval square. And so we'll get some of these out. And we can see what we can do with those later. Now we've got our beautiful little robot guys and I'm going to take one of these and I'm going to upscale it. So I'm going to go with number four. Upscale number four. Here's a little cute one. Now he looks upset, but don't worry. We can actually edit this a little bit ourselves later on. Now, whilst that's upscaling and I'm going to come to an image upscaler, which allows us to upscale our works because it's always good to work with the highest resolution possible and it will give us more flexibility when we come to turn these into vectors. So we've upscaled our little guy. We're going to click on open in browser. This will open up separately. We can right click and go to save image as. But this little guy is still just a PNG. So we have to come into the image upscaler and we're going to upscale him by dragging him into the drag and drop box. Go to start and this little guy will upscale himself and I'll be much larger. But he's still a PNG. So therefore, we need to make him into a vector. And to do that, I'm going to show you two ways. One is using professional tool and the other is free. And whilst it's also working, you can come back into Midjourney and keep spitting out different versions of your prompt until you get ones you like. I quite like this square guy with a plant in front of him. He is very unusual. <laughs> it's almost like a, a scanner has a life form. So upscale him too. God, oh, things are a little bit slow today. Come on, you're supposed to be an AI and I'm sitting here sipping my coffee. Once you get the green button appear, therefore you can download it. So you download it, it opens up and in a window, enlarge it, right click, go to, you can actually just copy the image or you can save it. So we're going to go with save image as and we come to downloads. Now we're going to come into Adobe Illustrator and I'm going to show you how to turn things into vectors. Here's one I made earlier. You can see this is a perfectly created vector, a little doggy. So you can come and find your file, drag and drop it into Illustrator. And what we're going to do with this little guy is we're going to use a tool called Image Trace. So if you come to the right hand properties toolbar and go down to Image Trace, which is at the bottom left, it will say it might work quite slowly because it's a large image. And we're going to say OK for now. We'll see how slow it is. How slow are you? You see, it did pretty well. Now, the first time it does it, it will automatically do it on a default preset, which will leave you out with this black and white guy. And it, it's actually worked pretty well, even in black and white. I like this effect. It's uh, more minimal. And there are a couple of ways that you can repurpose black and white images like this very effectively. So make sure to stick around for those later. But we're going to change the preset and I'm going to go to a high fidelity photo. Sit back, relax. Have your coffee, everyone. Make sure you have at least three liters of coffee a day. It's the only way to be successful with digital products. Now you can see that it's come out pretty well. You have the option to also come into the image trace panel, which gives you full control over how complicated you would like the output to be. You can adjust uh, the colors, the tones, and much more. But we're going to leave it as it is. There's no reason to mess about with things unless you need to. So if there is an error or it's too complicated, you can do that. But I'm going to go to expand. And you can see here that it's got a lot of different elements. So I'm going to go ahead and start dragging over the image. I'm then going to ungroup it by going Command Shift G, which now allows me to select different parts of the image and easily delete them. So I'm going to go around and delete everything that I don't want. So as I went into this image a little bit more, I noticed that there's way too many different elements and I'm actually going to go back and reprocess the image trace, make it a little bit more simple. So a way you can do that is to use the preset of six colors, which will just limit the entire image to six colors. And essentially it will help reduce a lot of the detail. You can see here we've lost some colors, but we've kept it much more simpler. You can see here there are 
it was much easier to delete the outside elements. So that's one tip. If you want to make this easy for yourself, change the preset to six colors. And then we have our little guy. Now, what's really cool, what I like, is that it's very easy to come into it and you can adjust elements, particularly the facial features. So you might want to make the smile much bigger. Or you can make him sad if you wanted. So this is kind of fun, but I want a happy robot. Once you're done, you can easily output your little guy. Go to save as, you can save on your computer. And you want to export it as a vector format. So I suggest using SVG it is the most ubiquitous file format for SVGs. And now we have a vectorized beautiful little guy. Now I'll show you another quick way that you can do this and that's using a free tool called vectorizer.ai where you can simply drag and drop your image inside and it will automatically resize your image and turn it into a vector. What's great about this is that it's free and it's quick and it's an online tool. However, you don't get as much control as you do in Illustrator. But you can see it's had a fantastic result. And you can simply download it by clicking on the download tool at the top. Here you do have an option to choose the file format and some other options. Most of it you can leave as it is. There's no reason to change any of this. And you can go ahead and download it. And if we come back into Illustrator, drag and drop our new little guy inside, you can see that it's done a fantastic job at doing this. You can actually then go ahead and adapt it as you like. I would say that the Illustrator version has done a better job at creating simpler shapes, but the Vectorizer version has done a better job at retaining a lot of the detail. So depending on the type of work that you're using, you can actually use different tools. I would recommend using Illustrator if you're looking to really create minimal, uh, clean shapes. But if you've got very complicated work, actually using Vectorizer is not a bad idea at all. Now we have our vectors. We have a product that we can sell. And this is one of my favorite parts is because we get to be really creative again. And this is an option where I think you get to be creative in a different sense. You get to be creative in a business marketing sense. And one of the ways to do this is to work out how can you repurpose my product to sell it in different ways, to either bundle it, unbundle it, to repurpose it, uh, or to put a certain marketing framing on it to make it appeal to different audiences. One tool I love to start off with is Wirestock, which allows you to submit your artwork to multiple marketplaces in one go. And it handles the keywording and the uploading for you. So this basically automates and speeds up the process of submitting your works to different marketplaces. And it's a great place to start when you're selling your vectors. So if you've got a single vector, this is the very first step I would take. So for Wirestock, all you have to do is go to upload in the top right hand corner. Then you go to upload again and select computer if you're uploading from your computer. From here, we're going to upload our vector. They accept EPSs in this instance. So if you were in Illustrator, when you go to export, you don't want to save it as an SVG. You actually want to save it as an EPS. The submission guidelines vary depending on the platforms that you're using. You'll be able to see your file uploading in the bottom left hand corner. Make sure to add AI generated in the caption. And from that, you can simply go to post. And you'll see that you've automatically submitted your work to Shutterstock, Adobe Stock, Dreams Time, Deposit Photos, and Pond5. It's important to uncheck Getty Stock and also Alame, as they currently don't accept AI generated works. But exactly how they define whether a vector has been generated with AI or not, it is hard to see. And I would recommend that the amount of extra effort that you've put in actually differentiates your work from being a purely AI generated piece. If you're actually going into Illustrator, you're turning into a vector and you're changing and adapting it, I believe this adds a certain level of authorship that would mean in a copyright lawsuit, you would have your work deemed as human. But I'm no expert and the exact particulars of how AI generated content works with copyright law is yet to be fully defined. And the US are exploring in more detail what it means for a work to have human authorship. So you have to keep your ear to the ground for the current rules and regulations for each marketplace. What is also great about Wirestock is you, you get your own personal shop front set up automatically. So you can simply share your portfolio link and you'll have all of your assets there available for people to purchase. 
This is great at avoiding the huge fees that many marketplaces charge to sell your work. And if you're looking to set up your own shop, this is one of the quickest and easiest ways to do it. So I highly recommend Wirestock for speeding up your process and quickly getting your work in front of a lot of people. And what's particularly great is you can dive deep in the statistics about how well your products are selling across different marketplaces. So that's a great way to basically speed up the process and submit your work instantly to many marketplaces, especially if you've just made one vector, that's where you want to start. But after that, we have many different other ways to repurpose our work. And this is something that gets me really excited. I really enjoy this for some reason. Uh, so the first thing to do is use multiple marketplaces. So you cannot just use stock marketplaces like Adobe Stock, Getty Stock, Shutterstock, iStock, and all the other stock stocks. But there are designer marketplaces where designers are looking for vectors to reuse. So you can look at using some of these specific marketplaces, places like Envato, Creative Market, UI8.net, and many others. So that's the first step is look at multiple marketplaces. The second option that I really enjoy is uh, print on demand. So you can actually take your work and put them on print on demand services. These cute looking stickers are perfect for stickers, <laughs> essentially. So I recommend putting these on sites like Redbubble, on Spoonflower, which is a print-on-demand service particularly targeted at creating wallpapers and fabrics. So you can really upscale these and put them on large pieces of material. And these are great for basically if you take your image, turn it into a pattern. So what you do is you're repeating it. So it becomes like a pattern. You've got a repeating pattern that can be used in different instances. And this is really great for targeting fabric designers, interior designers, uh, and people working with large services. Now, another thing you can do is make sure that this works in different softwares. So you can not only produce the vector SVG file, but also offer a PNG, a transparent PNG. Uh, make sure that there is the Illustrator file that people can use immediately. You can make sure that it works as a stamp in Procreate. This is a really interesting area. So Procreate is a very popular digital art app. And you can take this image and turn it into a stamp. So it means that people can uh, literally create artworks with your art. So they're taking this vector image and turning it into a stamp. This works particularly well with black and white images, which is another option that you get, which is taking your image and turning it into just a black and white outline. The reason we do that is because it can be used in different instances, for example, as a stamp in Procreate, or you can use it as a physical stamp, so you can make stamps out of it. You can also turn it into a stencil, which can be used for people to create in real life. And it can be sold as a decal, like a vinyl decal that people can print out and stick on their walls. And there are a number of good print on demand services for just that. Now, there's some of the ways that you can reinterpret your vector for different artists. But what I think is really clever and a great way that you can go further is to start to take the uh, the the product and turn it into a bundle. So you don't just make one vector, you're going to make a hundred and you're going to put it up as a package and sell that for a higher ticket price. Uh, and this is where you can really target uh, different niches. So you might even offer a print on demand license, which allows people to take your work and print it on their own goods so they can make money from it. And the great thing about this is you can charge hundreds of dollars per license on a print on demand offering. This is what a lot of people were doing with my quotes and I allowed them to do that, but I was being paid up to a thousand pounds per license. Now, the next thing you do is also include a tutorial now, there's two options here. One is to create a tutorial about how you made this vector. So if there are people who are hobbyists or designers getting started and they want to understand what process you went through, you can create a tutorial about exactly your own process. Now, the other option is to create a tutorial and use it as a way to market the product, as well as an additional aspect that you can include when people buy the product. So you're not just selling a vector, you're also selling a tutorial. This works particularly well if you're targeting uh, arts and crafts niches or uh, beginners in the industry. Next up is you can take this and put it into templates. So for example, you might take this little robot vector and create a social media pack of templates in Canva where you're combining text with your images and then you're selling the asset and the text combination. So you're building out a new type of product that's targeted at social media marketers or small brand owners. You can also submit your graphics to the Canva library where people can use them 
and pay you every time they use them. So it's another place that you can submit your assets to. Finally, the, the newest, and I think, one of the biggest opportunities is to sell your prompts. So say you've created these vector prompts. First of all, you can sell them on a site like PromptBase where you're selling individual prompts. And I've put a few up here and it's making me a few dollars every day. The other option is to create a whole library of prompts and sell them as a book. I found this shop on Etsy is just selling different types of prompts and they're, they're doing really well. You can see they've made almost 3000 sales and this shop has only been open for a few months and they've got a thousand mid-journey prompts. <laughs> but what's really interesting here is you're taking a single product and that you've done the work, but you can actually turn it into 20 or 30 products. And of course, not all of these are gonna be successful, but what you're doing is you're taking so many, many more shots. Like you're so much more likely to get a winner if you're taking more shots. And especially if you're looking creatively at how to repurpose your content in a way that sets you apart from other people, that you're being inventive, innovative, and creative. I certainly think that a lot of this is a combination of hard work, of luck, and of strategy. So you need to take a lot of shots, you need to get a little bit lucky, but then you need to be strategic and recognize what was the luck, what was the decision I made that gave me the opportunity to be successful. And that's where the final step comes in. Ah, so I wanted to just actually show you another example of a really good remarketing product. So. You can sell brushes on Procreate or on Photoshop or Affinity Designer. And these are combined basically of small vector shapes that have been turned into brushes inside of these art programs. But what I really liked about this creator, she's a very successful digital product creator, Katia Jazavaniska. She created this watercolor Procreate set that I'm sure has made millions of dollars just from this single Procreate brush set. And she's made a brush creators mega pack. So she's just gone that extra level, that extra abstract level of creating a pack of brush tools for brush creators. And I think this is really interesting how you can just abstract a, another layer and create a valuable tool for more people. So I thought this was a beautiful example of repurposing your own creations. So that brings me to the final step of the process, which is evaluating what has worked well. And this is a key step. So basically, once you've done this whole process, I think it's only at this point you can start to look back, recognize what might work, and then really dive deep into that and turn it into something that can start to make thousands and thousands of dollars. So I really empower you that if you don't get to this stage, if you haven't made a lot of product, if you haven't analyzed what's working well, you're, you're not going to be successful. You really have to put the work in, go through an iterative design process. It's very much like your own small, tiny startup where you are creating an MVP, you're getting customer feedback, you're validating the market fit, and then you're doubling down and creating a process to systematize and scale your project. So say you get like one niche that's working really well. What you have to do then is basically take that and expand it, like go into it. And the way to do that is to, for example, uh, like if we use my quote pack as an example, I saw like, oh, wow, this is selling quite well, this like single quote pack. Well, what I should do then is create other quote packs and I should bundle them together and I should expand it. So I will take different themes, different niches within this niche. So I had inspirational fitness quotes for like, you can't do it, everyone is a winner. To empowering girl boss quotes for the, um, empowering female entrepreneurs, to travel quotes, uh, uh, to deep quotes, philosophical quotes and expanding out this method. And I started to hire people to help me make these quotes. I started to create a process about how I was using a template on each of the packs, which I could start off with, which would give me a base set of fonts that I could use, that it would give me an inspiration about how to lay them out and um, different fonts are already working well. So you can already take a font pairing and repurpose it to another situation. You don't need to use different font pairing every single time. And then also the marketing screens, for example, that I can create templates for the marketing screens and reuse those each time. And then I'm creating a new product, I'm expanding my bundle, and I'm speeding up the process of how I'm creating this market. And if I was to go back and do this all again, if I could talk to myself again, it's like, <laughs> do this more. Like, why did I not make like 5,000 quotes? And why don't I focus down on this harder and really like create uh, really tailored shop fronts just for quotes instead of like selling my quotes via other marketplaces, like actually putting the effort into creating my own website that was like purely a quote shop 
uh, and really like targeting that, niching it down, turning it into a process and expanding on what was working well. And so that's my biggest advice is to reflect and turn what works well into a process. Don't move on and start like an entire new project. I definitely made the mistake of like trying way too many different brand categories, brand product categories. Walt Disney, the renowned animator and filmmaker, had a very beautiful process, which he had dubbed the dreamer, realist and spoiler. And it maps on very well to our own process. The dreamer stage was for fantasizing, for creating the most fantastic and absurd ideas possible. And for us, this is the probing stage where we are looking at all the possibilities and coming up with a lot of inspiration. Then he had the realist. The realist would re-examine and rework the ideas into something more practical. And this for us is the invent stage, where you're actually taking all of the inspiration and trying to create something that's going to be useful for people. Finally, in the third stage, he had the spoiler, where he would become the critic, shooting holes in his own work, tearing them apart and looking for ways to improve. And for us, that's the evaluation stage, where we're looking at what worked, what didn't work, removing what didn't work and doubling down on what did. But what I particularly love about Walt Disney is that he had three separate rooms and spaces to work on different stages of the project. And I, for one, certainly have different areas, different themes, different musical playlists, different outfits for when I'm wearing each different hat of the process. I love to work on pen and paper when I'm looking broadly, when I'm gathering inspiration and I'm really trying to map out different ideas. The fluidity and the tangible nature of working in that way helps me feel free and unrestrained. Whilst when I'm inventing, when I am the realist, I have to be much more serious and I put on a more melodic playlist, something that has no words to it and I sit in a chair at my computer and I put the hours in creating the product. Whereas the critic, I like to be slightly more reflective. Often I will take a walk before sitting down on a couch and looking at my work, imagining that I am a customer and refining exactly what I think has been working well and what didn't. I believe allowing ourselves to play different roles and fitting into different contexts Making sure that we're in the right mindset for each stage of the process is key to doing our best job at each of these processes. If you are interested in learning more about making and selling AI art, I have an entire course where I go into full depth of the entire process. We break down everything from product research to making your own art with AI and also creating listings that convert. We also explore how you can market your different products in interesting and innovative ways. And most of all, we talk about the ideas of building a brand and building a business and building an audience, which will allow you to set yourself up for success for years to come. And if you're interested in joining me, I've left a link with a discount in the description below. Remember that creating a digital product is not easy, but it can be incredibly rewarding. And there is nothing to stop people making five, six, seven figures with digital products. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, why not watch this video next for more on AI? I'm Samson Folds, and this is Delightful Design. Have a delightful day.